A Tennessee community is shocked when a beloved elderly woman vanishes. As investigators search, the mystery of her disappearance deepens. The truth begins to emerge, but slowly and in unexpected directions. As police and the FBI try to help a troubled small town find their dear friend. In 1992, a woman disappeared from her Memphis home. When the ransom went uncollected, the FBI suspected a desperate amateur and feared the worst. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the search for the woman progressed, investigators uncovered a web of lies and false accusations designed to hide the real perpetrator. Memphis, Tennessee, on August 7th, 1992, 25 miles outside the city in the small town of Eads. Successful land developer Alan Roberts arrived home from work. As usual, his wife's car was in the driveway, but he was surprised to find the mail there. His wife, Doe Roberts, usually left a note when she went out, but there was none. Doe! In the kitchen, Alan spotted Doe's asthma medication on the counter. She always took the inhaler when she went out. He called their closest friends nearby. Bill, yeah, Bill, this is Alan. Have you seen Doe today? Has she been over there? No one he spoke to had heard from Doe. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go look around the property for you. Do me a favor, call around see if you can find her, okay? Hello? Roberts worried she might have had an asthma attack while working in the garden. He searched the grounds of their farm. No sign of Doe. He was about to call the police when his telephone rang. Hello, Doe? It was a man speaking with an Asian accent. You have Doe? What do you mean you have Doe? What do you want? The caller demanded a $100,000 ransom for Doe's safe return. Not a problem. I can take care of it. Just, it'll take me a little time. You just let me know what, what you want me to do, and I'll do it, OK? But he didn't explain where to take the money. Where do you want me to take it? Before he no. hung up. Stunned, Allen immediately called the Shelby County Sheriff's Department and told them about his wife's disappearance and the ransom call he received. The team of deputies and sheriff's inspectors responded to the house. Roberts told them he did not recognize the voice of the caller and did not know anyone who would want to harm Doe. As the interview continued, agents from the FBI's Memphis field office arrived. Eads is about 30 miles from both the Arkansas and Mississippi borders. If someone took Doe across state lines, the FBI would take the lead since transporting a victim state to state is a federal crime. Roberts explained he last saw his wife that morning. So you plan on working in the they had eaten today? breakfast together, yes. as they had every morning for 43 years. At 10, Alan left to meet a prospective out-of-town buyer for a property he was developing.
The buyer, a man named Sam Wagner, had called the day before, making an appointment to see the property at 10.30 that morning. Morning, Todd. Robert said he waited for over an hour, but Sam Wagner never showed. He spent the rest of the afternoon laying sod at another of his development properties. The investigators needed to check the house for evidence. Robert showed them Doe's asthma inhaler and said if she suffered a serious attack without it, she could die. They needed to find her immediately. Looking for signs of forced entry, deputies checked doors and windows. Nothing appeared suspicious. Is it locked? Knowing that people sometimes run off voluntarily, faking abductions to cover themselves, deputies checked Doe's bedroom. Her suitcases and all of her clothing were still there, as were her valuables. It didn't seem like she left on her own. If someone had abducted her, one clue suggested it happened outside, according to FBI Special Agent Joanne Overall. Alan Roberts located mail halfway into the garage, and it was not taken into the house. He suspected that his wife had gone to the mailbox and never made it back into the house, and she had laid the mail down at that point. Beginning at the driveway, deputies formed search lines, fanning out in a grid pattern to scour the 150-acre farm for any sign of the 65-year-old woman or what happened to her. Despite the efforts of multiple search teams, they found nothing. The best chance for a new lead would be additional ransom calls. Got this hooked up. We began monitoring Alan Roberts' phone right after the kidnapping. With his consent, we placed a recorder on his phone should he get a call from the kidnapper. They also installed tracing equipment. If the man with the Asian accent called again, the FBI would be ready. Later that night, the phone rang. Yes. It was coming from a nearby payphone. No, ju just don't hurt her. I'll do whatever you want. Deputies headed toward the source of the call. Okay. It sounded like the okay. same man who called earlier. Okay. Sure. He said okay. Doe was safe for now, and he knew law enforcement was listening. Robert said the caller ordered him to remove the tape of their conversation and crush it in the driveway. They quickly switched it with a blank tape. At that time, no surveillance officers were outside. When Shelby County deputies arrived at the payphone, it was clear. Whoever made the call was gone. By daybreak, investigators expanded their search into the Eads community, asking friends and neighbors when they last saw Doe and if they noticed anything unusual on the day of her disappearance. Doe and Alan Roberts. Yeah, sure. They live right over there. No one recalled seeing or hearing from her that day. Yes, sir. One neighbor told investigators that at church that week, there seemed to be tension between Doe and Alan. But no solid clues emerged. Word of the kidnapping spread, and news stations picked up the story. Joe Birch of WMC-TV in Memphis reported on the small community's reaction to Doe's disappearance. 
A lot of people felt it must have been someone from the outside who committed this crime. Because these people worshipped together, they went to square dances together, they spent a lot of their time together, and their focus was their little community and staying away from downtown Memphis and all the danger that might be here. Um, so, I think the people in the Eads community felt like an outsider probably committed this crime. But investigators wondered how, in a place like Eads, a stranger wasn't noticed. As the investigation's first full day drew to a close, Special Agent Overall's concern grew. The 24 hours immediately following a kidnapping are critical. As more time passes, the chances of finding the victim alive diminish rapidly. On the second day, community members gathered to show their support and offer prayers for Doe's safe return. While the town of Eads prayed, investigators turned their attention to the most likely suspect. In a case like this, we always look at the family members and relatives, people that are closest to the victim first, and then work the circle outwards. They needed to start with the husband, Alan Roberts. It was possible he had harmed Doe, then used an accomplice to make the ransom calls. It is always difficult when family members realize they are suspects. Authorities had to ask the worried husband to take a polygraph test. It was an unexpected request, but Alan agreed. A polygraph measures a subject's physiological reactions while answering questions. The subject reviews all of the questions before the test, so there are no surprises. Though commonly called a lie detector test, a polygraph does not actually detect lies. It only detects whether the subject is exhibiting the characteristics most people exhibit when lying. Spikes in heart rate, perspiration, blood pressure, and respiration. Are you convinced that I will only ask you questions that we've gone over before? While polygraph results are rarely admissible in court, many investigators find they point them in the right direction. Is your first name Alan? Yes. The examiner asked Roberts questions unrelated to the case to establish a baseline for truthful responses. Then he asked questions about his relationship with Doe and the events of the day she disappeared. Did you kill Doe Roberts? No. The examiner then interpreted the graphic output to determine if Roberts appeared to be deceptive on the questions about the case. Okay. All right. In his opinion, Alan Roberts answered all of the questions truthfully. Alan was sure this was the end of it. But agents knew the test results were not always accurate. They could not eliminate him yet. To check Robert's story, the FBI wanted to find Sam Wagner, the man he allegedly went to meet on the morning of Doe's abduction. We thought Sam Wagner may have come into this area, and because of their financial backings and holdings, that he may have kidnapped Doe Roberts for the money that they had, because they had a substantial amount of money. Agents checked FBI databases and nationwide DMV records, searching for anyone named Sam Wagner. In several states, FBI agents interviewed men of that name, but eliminated each as a suspect. Alan Roberts' story became more suspicious when Sam Wagner became an unknown individual that we couldn't locate, and it became more apparent to us that Alan Roberts could possibly be behind the kidnapping. Looks like he checks out. I don't think he's going to take If it. Alan did do something to his wife, perhaps the couple's phone records and banking statements would reveal a clue. 
There's nothing unusual about any of the phone calls. Yet investigators uncovered only evidence of a normal life spent in a small town with no sign of contact with anyone suspicious and no record of Doe spending money after August 7th. No leads were panning out. Eventually, they came to believe Doe Roberts was dead. After approximately two to three weeks of being unable to locate the victim, it was more than likely going to end up being a homicide. I requested through my supervisor that we bring in Shelby County Sheriff's Department into the investigation to make it a joint investigation. If it were a murder, it would be prosecuted in state court. The team returned to the Roberts house. The second search of Alan Roberts' property was done more in a forensic frame of mind, and we were looking for blood spatterings in the house as well as in the barn. Again, Roberts cooperated. He would do anything. Forensics technicians from the FBI and the Sheriff's Department processed the buildings, looking for any evidence of a murder, cleanup, or disposal of a body. They also gathered hairs and carpet fibers from Allen's truck to compare to any evidence recovered later. The painstaking search lasted two full days. Alan Roberts grew more frustrated that law enforcement had to devote so much time to him as a suspect. He was wearing down. And the real kidnapper was out there, somewhere. In 1992, the Shelby County Sheriff's Department and the Memphis FBI searched Alan Roberts' farm and its buildings for any sign of his wife's possible murder. Roberts had passed a polygraph, and now none of the items on his property tested positive for blood. Yet no other suspects emerged, and investigators had developed circumstantial evidence that implicated Roberts. Although several witnesses had seen Roberts that day, his confirmed alibi only accounted for about five hours. Authorities knew that left plenty of time to get rid of a body. Also, some members of the Eads community gave statements claiming Alan Roberts had acted in a suspicious manner following Doe's disappearance, according to Special Agent Joanne Overall. People within the community felt he did not openly grieve for the loss of his wife. He was socializing shortly after her kidnapping that both him and his wife were members of a square dancing group. And within a couple of weeks, Alan was back at the square dancing group with various partners. News anchor Joe Birch observed Robert's lack of emotion during media coverage. When somebody's wife disappears, you'd expect to see a level of emotion. And we just didn't see it from Alan Roberts. He was just kind of calm, cool, and collected, and very direct. And there wasn't a, a lot of uh, teary-eyed, emotional appeals that we see a lot in, in kidnapping cases. Investigators kept watching Roberts as he tried to carry on with his life, struggling with the frustration of not knowing where his wife was and being the only suspect in her disappearance. Yet they saw nothing that led them to Doe Roberts. In September, the man with the Asian accent resurfaced, now saying Alan was involved. Hello? The kidnapper began calling people in the Eads community, stating that Doe Roberts was still alive. Many of the phone calls indicated Alan was part of the scheme to kidnap his wife. It was extremely frustrating because he never gave specific points to drop money. Several of the people who talked to the kidnapper had caller IDs on their phones, so agents traced the calls to phone booths on a well-traveled road. 
we would go to the phone booth immediately, and of course, the individual who was making the phone call was already gone. Other people had already used the phone. We would check the phones for possible fingerprints, and there was just never any evidence to tie an individual to that phone. Each of the calls were made within a few miles of the Roberts house, a significant risk in a small community buzzing about the case. This boldness suggested that the caller was an insider, familiar enough to be inconspicuous in public, and that he considered himself beyond the reach of investigators. Desperate for something solid, Alan Roberts took things into his own hands, offering a reward for Doe's safe return and announcing he disconnected the FBI's recording and tracing equipment from his phone so the kidnapper could call freely. On October 8, 1992, two months after Doe disappeared, the kidnapper called Alan Roberts again. Is she okay? He told him to drive to a payphone at a country store a mile away, now. Roberts hurried to the store. Once again, he was on his own with no corroborating witness to prove what was happening. The phone was already ringing when he arrived. He hoped, finally, this would be his chance to get his wife back. Hello? Two months after someone abducted 65-year-old Doe Roberts, the kidnapper ordered her husband, Alan Roberts, to a payphone. Hello? Hello? The man with the Asian accent said Doe was alive and still with him. He asked Roberts for the name of an intermediary, someone Alan trusted that the kidnapper could contact. Somebody at the church? What do you mean, somebody at the church? Robert suggested Charles Lord, a leading church member and friend of the family. The caller said he would be in touch about where to bring the ransom money. Can I talk to Doe? Let me, please, let me talk to Doe. What? Hello? Then Hello? he hung up. Well, they, they've been good neighbors. Charles Lord, the man Roberts picked to be his intermediary, was a civil servant and treasurer of the local church. He made a public appeal to the kidnapper on Alan Roberts' behalf, asking the man to call him and finally give specific instructions for a ransom drop. They all wanted to get Doe back. More calls from the kidnapper came to Charles Lord and others in the community, but still no details for an exchange. In November 1992, Charles Lord called investigators to his home. Special Agent Joanne Overall hoped they finally had a direct link to the kidnapper. Charles Lord stated that late in the evening, he heard a car out on his cove. He walked down to the mailbox, and there was a letter placed in his mailbox, which was a kidnapping ransom letter. Investigators were glad to have physical evidence. Fingerprints, hairs of fibers on the letter might provide a link to the kidnapper. But by the time they got to it, they found the evidence tainted. Charles Lord took this letter and showed it to several people before we were called in and obtained the letter. So there was quite a few fingerprints on the letter before we got it. Lab examiners checked all of the prints, determining they belonged to Lord and the people he let handle the letter. Nothing to lead them to the kidnapper. The message was no help either. The ransom had been lowered, but still, no instructions for a drop. It seemed the kidnapper was playing games with them. In case he contacted Lord again, agents set a trap. Our office set up surveillance on his mailbox using a hidden camera, 
which was literally placed in a birdhouse close to the mailbox. If the kidnapper dropped off another note, they'd have him on tape. Agents also installed wiretap and recording devices on Lord's telephone. They still had no real evidence against Alan Roberts, but a new suspect was developing. Charles well, Lord began uh, taking an active role in the investigation, often stopping by the sheriff's office to check on their progress. The Roberts, no Roberts? Yes, sir. The deputies became suspicious. He seemed too interested. Their suspicion deepened because of the peculiar nature of the phone calls he claimed he got from the kidnapper. Charles Lord stated he received several phone calls from the kidnapper. He did say that he talked with Doe Roberts, which was unusual because none of the other callers talked with Doe Roberts. But agents never got tapes of the calls. But every time he received a telephone call, it, it appeared that our equipment didn't work. Over the next week, Lord reported another ransom letter and one of Doe's scarves placed in his mailbox. Agents recovered no evidence from the items, but hoped their camera captured images of the kidnapper. They had plenty of the regular mail carrier. But when the tape got to where the kidnapper should appear, it went blank. When the equipment that was placed at Charles Lord's residence continued to fail, I just thought we had poor equipment. Eventually, it became apparent that somebody was tampering with it. Agents suspected the interference came from Charles Lord. Then the victim's husband, Alan Roberts, reported a strange encounter with Lord. He said the night before at the Eads Community Center, Lord summoned him to a private meeting. Alan was surprised when his friend offered to help get Doe back for a price. Alan Roberts told me that Charles Lord had advised that he had underworld contacts and that there was information available if Charles could get some money to pay for it. Also, Alan advised at that time that Charles Lord was wearing a gun. It was clear. Lord was somehow involved. But investigators needed more than suspicion. They needed evidence. On March 4th, 1993, seven months after Doe disappeared, there was another twist in the case. Memphis news anchor Joe Birch received a call at his office. never recorded a telephone conversation before, but I decided that I would record this conversation. The call set off a trigger in my mind that this could be the same individual who's been making the anonymous calls in the Doe Roberts case, and I tried to get the man to stay on the line for as long as he would stay. As Birch spoke to the man with the Asian accent, he tried to elicit details as to who the caller was and what happened to Doe. When Birch tried to set up a ransom drop, the caller hung up. Hello? Hello? I took the tape directly into my boss's office. We immediately called the FBI and the Shelby County Sheriff's Department. What can you tell us about Doe Roberts? Investigators agreed to WMC-TV airing the tape, hoping it might flush the kidnapper out. It worked. The kidnapper called back. He was angry they aired the tape and demanded no more coverage. But this time, Joe Birch got him to do what no one else had. 
arrange a ransom drop. Agents and sheriff's inspectors staked out the drop location, ready to grab the caller who had eluded them for so long. Is that her? That's her. You could get past them. As instructed, a reporter from WMC-TV drove to the spot with $80,000 in cash. It's her, but I don't see anybody else. Do you see anybody else? Everyone waited, hoping. Sit tight. Sit tight. We may have somebody else. They may, they may be waiting. But the kidnapper never showed. She's leaving. One more disappointment in a frustrating investigation. Be advised, subject has just left. No contact. Show us going ahead and clear the scene. Other deputies observed Charles Lord was home the entire time. Weeks passed with no movement on the case. Then, in June 1993, the kidnapper arranged another drop. He called two of Doe's nephews and told them to bring the ransom money to a local motel. Soon, the elusive kidnapper finally would surface. In June 1993, investigators working the Doe Roberts kidnapping staked out an Eads, Tennessee motel Special Agent Joanne Overall was part of the surveillance. Doe Roberts' nephews received a call from the kidnapper, and they tried to make an arranged ransom drop. They were told to go to a motel room, which they did, but they also called the FBI. They were waiting to get a phone call or meet with somebody. Other surveillance deputies had been unable to find suspect Charles Lord that night. As the team at the motel watched, a man approached. It was Lord. He went to the room the nephews had rented. Charles Lord told the nephews of Doe Roberts that he had received a call from the kidnapper and that he was to show up there and get the money and he would receive a phone call as to where to take the money. But the nephews wouldn't give him the cash. They said they wanted to deal with the kidnapper directly. Investigators were sure that was exactly who they were dealing with. He is the only individual who had received a telephone call stating that he had uh, talked with Doe Roberts, and now he was meeting with somebody to pick up money, but we did not have enough evidence at that time to go forward with an arrest. They did, however, increase their focus on Lord. To look for a financial motive to the kidnapping, the FBI subpoenaed Lord's bank records we went through records trying to determine if he had loans out, if he, what his financial holdings were, and it became apparent that Charles Lord owed a lot of money to several banks in town, substantial amounts of money, and that he was unable to meet the payments and that he had filed for bankruptcy. That circumstantial evidence allowed investigators to secure a search warrant for Lord's house. In late June 1993, they served the warrant, which allowed them to look for and seize any financial documents. Some of the files they recovered revealed Lord's criminal past. He had embezzled over $150,000 from the Memphis Depot, where he had retired several years prior, and he had embezzled approximately $70,000 from the church there in Eads, where he was attending. As treasurer of the church, Lord had access to the parish bank accounts and cash donations. 
Despite the find, investigators still had no direct evidence of the abduction. We had nothing that we could use to charge him with the kidnapping and the murder of Doe Roberts. It was important to obtain a confession from Charles Lord because we had no body. Good, maybe this will help us out. One agent working the case was trained in criminal profiling. He wants more attention. Analyzing Lord's actions, he offered a behavioral profile to help get the confession. What do we have here? We got all these files. Is he going to refuse? He suggested Lord was a manipulative, pathological liar who believed he was untouchable. It's going to help us out, but I don't know if it's going to help. The agent felt that overwhelming the suspect's ego was the only way to beat him. What you guys need to do is let The plan was to bring Lord in for an interview and let him see what he would take to be evidence of a massive investigation against him for months. Agents created numerous evidence boxes, hoping to trump Lord's belief he was above the investigation. Then, on August 25th, 1993, at the FBI's Memphis field office, investigators met with Lord and his attorney. I've got some questions about, do you know anything about Mrs. Dare Roberts? As Charles Lord sat in that room during the interview, I was watching him look at these boxes, realizing that he had been under surveillance for a lot longer than he had anticipated. And he became very nervous. The FBI's tactics appeared to be working. Lord eventually admitted to making some of the ransom calls. He said he did it to keep the investigation alive for Doe's sake, but denied any involvement in her abduction. Sensing that he was ready to crack, the investigators offered him a deal. Charles Lord was told by our office, as well as the Shelby County inspector, that if he would take a polygraph and pass a polygraph, we would not look at him any further for the Doe Roberts kidnapping. However, if he failed the polygraph, his attorney and Charles Lord agreed to a further interview interrogation in reference to the kidnapping. He agreed. After asking control questions to gauge Lord's truthful response levels, the polygraph examiner asked about Doe, including whether Lord was involved in her abduction. Did you harm Doe Roberts? In the end, the examiner believed the polygraph results showed Lord being deceptive. Though the results could not be used in court, they meant authorities could continue questioning the suspect. With Lord's attorney present in the interrogation room, FBI agents and inspectors from the Shelby County Sheriff's Department pressed the suspect, returning again and again to the polygraph results. I've got every piece of evidence I need. What I need you to do. At first, he continued to deny involvement. But after several hours, the interview tactics wore him down. Lord said he was ready to tell them what happened. He said he needed cash to pay back his loans and cover the money he stole from the church and decided to kidnap Doe for ransom. On August 6, 1992, he called the Roberts, posing as a property buyer named Sam Wagner, and arranged to meet Allen. The next day, when he knew Allen was waiting at the development property, he drove by their house. Doe was bringing in the mail. Doe, there's been an accident. He knew she would trust him. Alan's been involved in an accident. Yeah. Get in the car and I'll take you to him. What happened? Do you know? Do you, uh, is he all right? Lord told investigators he planned to release Doe after he got the ransom, but she suffered a fatal heart attack in his car. He said he panicked and dumped her body in her purse, but he would not say where. Would you be willing to take us to where she is? The investigators believed he was lying, at least about planning to release Doe, and perhaps about other details. You did what you were supposed to do. Now Special Agent Joanne Overall knew they had to find the body to check his story. They offered a deal. 
Charles Lord agreed to tell us where Doe Roberts' body was after he had confessed to the kidnapping in exchange for Shelby County not pursuing the death penalty. Lord claimed he dumped her in the Wolf River, a slow-moving river that runs 90 miles across the southwest corner of the state. The Wolf River empties into the Mississippi at Memphis. Lord said he dumped the remains from a bridge in Fayette County, 13 miles from the Roberts' home. Divers would begin 50 yards upriver, searching for the body and purse. Lieutenant John Yancey of the Shelby County Sheriff's Department led the dive in the murky river. We had 21 divers involved total. The visibility in the river was uh, zero. It was total black water. And in the dark water, several species of venomous snakes. Adding to the challenge was the fact that the crime took place a year earlier. Any remains would be scattered and difficult to find. FBI agents and sheriff's deputies helped the divers by stretching a rope across the river's width. Divers held onto the rope and moved across its length, searching the river bottom by hand. Normally, you do an arm span to arm over arm for a search for a body because it's large. But we were looking for contents of the purse at the time to try to make sure that this was actually the scene. So we had to bring it down to where we were. Instead of doing the large arm spans, we were having to do what I call this the hand grab. And that's where you just get the dirt with your hand. And that way, you're able to find everything on the bottom. Once the divers reached the other bank, the team would move the rope a foot down river and start over. Any time a diver found something, he signaled, and additional divers came in to mark and extract the item. We found a safe that had been taken in a robbery of a cleaner's, and the money had fallen out of the safe, and uh, we found the pennies on the bottom and the dollar bills, but we found no contents of any of her purse. So I feel like if we'd have found pennies on the bottom, we would have found her makeup or a wallet or IDs or anything times back to her. In 110 degree heat, the team continued their search of every square inch. On my second day, I was on the, the bridge and, a, and an elderly lady walked up to me and said, I want you to do me a favor. And I said, I'll try to if I can. She said, I want you to find us something today so we can get this over with, so we can go ahead and bury Doe and get this case over with. After three full days, they had searched a half mile of the river. They believed the body would not have gone farther than that in the lowland waters. I went to my boss, my chief, and I told him, I said, based on my experience and what we have done, she's not in here. But if you want us to continue the search, we'll search till it runs into Mississippi, every how you want to do it. But I can tell you right now, she's not here. Investigators were convinced Lord had lied to them, unnecessarily placing the dive team in danger. Special Agent Overall confronted Lord. We took Charles Lord out to the site and explained to him that these divers were putting their lives in jeopardy and we needed to find the body and it didn't appear that the body was there. The suspect had run out of lies. Now he was ready to tell investigators what really happened to Doe Roberts. After a three-day search of Tennessee's Wolf River, dive leader Lieutenant John Yancey believed the remains of kidnapping victim Doe Roberts were not in the river. We had searched everywhere possible in this over the years of experience. Uh, I would have found something by now, either some bones, some makeup, or something. I said, based on my experience, she's not in here. There the divers are. She's not there. Investigators confronted suspect Charles Lord. The deal's going to come off the table. Realizing they would not give up until they got the truth, Lord admitted Doe had not died of a heart attack in his car. They 
He said he took her to his house and tied her up in a room above the garage. He could never let his neighbor go, now. He tried to kill her with sleeping pills. When that didn't work, he smothered her with a pillow. Lord said he buried her in his backyard compost heap. On top of the body, he placed a layer of lime, then concrete, hoping they would hasten decomposition. They needed to determine if Lord was telling the truth this time, to retrieve evidence and give Doe's family the closure of knowing what happened. The sheriff's department called in forensic anthropologists from the University of Tennessee. After removing layers of leaves and compost, they began the dig. Shelby County Sheriff's Lieutenant Ronald Goodwin supervised the meticulous excavation. It's just uh, using brushes and little trials, much like uncovering artifacts. And it's just, it's one spoonful at a time to make sure that you don't miss any evidence and make sure you don't do anything to harm what evidence may be with the body. After two hours, they pierced a shell of concrete and lime. In the space underneath, a body. Well, the first thing that we came to was a hand. The rest of the body was laying flat in the uh, grave site uh, on its back face up. It took 17 hours to completely exhume the remains, and what investigators found surprised them. The skin was intact. The body was in such good condition, I felt like the many scientific tests that we could run might reveal it's a poisoning, a cause of death, a sexual attack, or whatever. It appeared that the actions that uh, Mr. Lord had taken such as the lime and so forth on top of the body had worked in reverse and it had preserved the body for us. The most chilling detail was the position of the 65-year-old woman's hand. The only thing that was out of normal position was the hand which was up in front of her face in a defensive position with a finger spread. It appeared to investigators she might not have been dead when she was buried. Maybe she was still alive. Maybe she was pushing up with her hand. Over a year after Doe Roberts disappeared, the FBI and Alan Roberts had their evidence. On October 19, 1993, Charles Lord pled guilty to first-degree murder and kidnapping. He was sentenced to life plus 25 years. Joe's husband, Alan, had endured being a suspect for months. Now, with the truth out, he could finally lay Doe to rest. But one challenge remains for Alan Roberts. It's an uneven closure. I'm trying to forget about Charles Lord, and I'm praying that God will let me Forgive him. I'm praying that Doe is in God's hands right now. Mr. and Mrs. Roberts enjoyed 43 years of marriage before they were torn apart. He has faith that one day he will see her again.